Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, you should know that prior to the coming of Christ, from the time of Solomon on, well, except for the Babylonian captivity, uh, that there was a temple where they used to do animal sacrifices. King David was not allowed to build the temple because he was a man of war, had blood on his hands. However, he assembled all the materials for his son Solomon. So they call it, you know, Solomon's Temple. However, with Christ being resurrected, the Bible teaches that our bodies are, well, when they're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that um, the church is the temple. Now, what there are some interesting things that you might be interested in knowing. The temple was, well, let's go back a little bit, take a look at some history here. All right, so Solomon built a temple, and that was where they did the worship and the sacrifices unto the Lord. And then, after Solomon died, his son took over, and then there was a, a division between Israel and Judah. And then the Lord got angry with northern Israel, whose capital was Samaria. Judah's capital was Jerusalem. And in Jeremiah 3.8, he divorced Israel, but not Judah. But then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, promised that there would be a remarriage one day, a new covenant. And then with Christ came approximately 30 AD, he started his ministry. According to some historians, Bible scholars, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I'm not, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say it. It's somewhat skeptical. But in a prox, when he, um, after he was crucified, well, when he was on the cross being crucified, he said, it is finished. And in Matthew 24, around the first chapter, I mean, uh, verse 1, Jesus, they asked, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, you know, well, hey, he's like, hey, take a look at these, uh, these buildings. Isn't this magnificent? And Jesus said, you know, there would come a time when not one stone would be left upon another. Well, that was fulfilled in 70 AD. At the, when the, if you want to call them Jews, you can. When they revolted against Rome, the Roman armies came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple totally destroyed it. And the promise of Jesus in Matthew 24, where he said that not one stone would be left upon another, was fulfilled. Now, reason being was there was a lot of gold in the temple. And when they set the temple on fire, all the gold melted. And it went in between all the cracks of the rocks. So they uh, took all the stones, ripped them apart, scraped all the rocks to get all the gold. Because there was a lot of gold in the temple, people. A lot. It was very elegant, very opulent. Every stone was, not, was thrown down, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24. 
you can read it yourself if you wish. I'm, I don't want to make this a long, long, long study. But, um, well, after, after, um, but prior to this, I'm sorry, prior to this, when uh, Solomon's lineage, they got so bad that the Lord, well, he cast Israel out of his sight. The Assyrian Empire took them away. Gone. You're out of here. They never returned to the land. And then years later, Babylon came and did the same thing to Judah. Judah had gotten so bad, so bad. Read Jeremiah chapter 3 if you really want to know what's, what's what. Maybe we'll go into some more detail on that. I was going to make this a, a fairly quick study because I had a few points that I wanted to make about the temple. But I think I should make this a real study. Uh, I've got a few ideas of what I want to do. All right, let's go back to the beginning. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We'll do verse 1. And it came to pass when the king, now we're talking about David here, and it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Boy, I'll tell you what, how, that's, that's a testimony right there. Go and tell my servant, David, thus saith the Lord, shalt thou build me a, uh, shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the day that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word to any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. However, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled... And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. In other words, you know, you're dead. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will, estab I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So, the... Sh the shadow of this would have been uh, Solomon, but ultimately it was to be Christ, right? He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. 
If he commit iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So, obviously they're talking about Solomon here. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Right. Well, King David was, uh, well, Christ was the root and the offspring of David. We read that in um, Revelation 22. Let me look it up. All right. That is in Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. Uh, some of your new Bibles, like the NIV and the complete Jewish Bible, which is supposed to be a Messianic Bible, uh, removes the word Lucifer in Isaiah 14 and inserts the word morning star. So Lucifer becomes the morning star. But yet Jesus in Revelation 22, 16 says he is the morning star. So I guess what the complete Jewish Bible and the NIV is trying to tell you is, is that Jesus, the morning star, is Lucifer. Well, to them he is. To them, he's the devil. So, because <laughs> who's their father? Satan the, the devil, if you ask me. And trust me, that's not some light thing that I'm telling you. It's true. It is extremely true. I've looked it up. And they've known about this for years, and they've never changed it. But they know most people, most people that uh, pew warmers that are churchgoers, are too stinking lazy and and they don't believe nothing anyways. You know they don't really care. You know oh well, you just you know that the Bible people would never call Jesus the same name as Lucifer. You know they count on your ignorance and trustability, you know, trustworthiness. Yeah, and then you find out that the uh, largest publisher of Bibles in the English-speaking word is the owned by the parent company of the company that prints the Satanic Bible of the Church of Satan and gay porn. Yeah. And you know of their uh, parent company as being Fox News. Yeah. So... All right, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, think about it. Christ is the root and offspring of David. He's the king. And his kingdom's going to be forever. So... The thing is, if there had to be a king ruling after the, uh, well, when you figure that Jerusalem fell, when Christ was born, the virgin birth, crucified, died, buried, and resurrected, he became the king. So there, you know, but what about the in, the period before that, when Jerusalem was conquered, and they didn't, and and Judah didn't have a king sitting on the throne of Jerusalem. W what about that? What about that before Christ came? Well, you know what's interesting is there are legends that there were descendants of the royal family of Judah ruling in different parts of the world. Most notably, England. You can read about this stuff. 
You know, so either that stuff is true or King David didn't have somebody ruling from the throne and God's promises were null and void. They were a lie. You know, but if you believe that kind of stuff, well, then they, you know, they, they say, uh, they try to make you think that you're in some kind of a cult. Well, believing the promises of God is wrong, really? I mean, you know, 2 Samuel 7, 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Well, you know what? When, when Rome took over Jerusalem, there was no king related to David that I know of. Who was ruling? Certainly not, you know, Herod wasn't. Herod was an Edomite. He wasn't from David. He was from Esau. So where is the promise of God being fulfilled? Personally, I believe it was in England or Scotland or whatever. Look up Teatifa, T-E-A, second word, T-E-P-H-I. Uh, according to English legend, uh, Jeremiah took daughters of the royal seed and fled to the... Uh, to the Isles of England. I don't know. You know, people say, oh, that's not true. Well, it says right here that the throne would be established forever. And there was a period of time in Jerusalem where there was no king of David sitting on the throne. So either God's promises failed, and he's a liar, or the promises fulfilled somewhere else. Take your pick. And one day when you're in the kingdom, you'll know all the truth. But until then, it's my uh, duty in life to throw a monkey wrench into the machinations uh, mass of the false church world theology. If you, you know, you get my drift. I like throwing monkey wrenches in the machinery. I love it. Because their machinery won't hold up to close investigation and scrutiny. You know, it's great. You just, you know, go to church, throw a few bucks in the plate, listen to the pastor tell a few jokes and tell you how he was on the golf course and how they... They're a missionary in a foreign country that you've never met. You know, I mean, they could be lying to you. Oh, yeah, we're over in Afghanistan preaching the gospel. How do you know that? Did you ever meet the guy? You ever see pictures? You know, uh, you know, I, I, I was at a, a church, and they were talking about collecting money for the missionaries, and we did all this stuff and collected a bunch of money. Next thing you know, the pastor's driving a, a Cadillac. And my dad was like, you know, pointing that out, like, yeah, there you go. And it was one of the two most expensive models. Uh, there was two models, depending upon what um, options you got. It, they, these two models, could either one could have been the most expensive one, but it was like one of the two most expensive ones. Back in the day, uh, it was not the El Dorado. It was the other model. I don't remember all the old models of Cadillacs. I used to, dad always wanted a Cadillac, but. We were just middle class. He couldn't afford it. And if I'd had some kind of career, I'd have probably bought him one. But I wasn't a good son, so what can I tell you? So, Lord speaking to Nathan about David. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord, 
O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For, for thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake and according to thine heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them? Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible, for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations, and their gods, plural, gods. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast established, I'm sorry, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house, therefore hast, uh, therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. All right, let's go to, we read about David. Let's, now David died and Solomon, his son, is ruling in his place or his stead. You've heard of instead? Well, he's ruling in his stead, in his place. Now, Hiram is the uh, king of Tyre. And from what I understand, they were near Lebanon. And the cedars of Lebanon were a very, very famous tree. They have pretty much, I think they were pretty much all chopped down. But they were extremely famous. And they chopped down a bunch of those trees and used them to make the, uh, the temple. Now, if you became a member of the Masonic Lodge, which I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a Mason. Um, I got interested in studying about them uh, when I started studying the um, the world and the um, the illuminated ones. Well, you know, from the Angel of Light, those people. You know, it's like an octopus, but it has a lot more than eight arms. It, the the uh, the beast goes in so many directions. I mean, it's financial. I investigated the financial arm. I investigated the military arm. I investigated the religious arm. I mean, there are so many different denominations. But I studied the um, Masonic Lodge from people that were ex-members of it. And believe it or not, I was able to go to a used bookstore and I bought their own books and read them. Uh, for example, I briefly owned uh, Morals and Dogma by um, Albert Pike. Uh, from what I understand, he founded the um, Ku Klux Klan. And it was way too in-depth for me. Uh, I was kind of a, I was a baby Christian back then. So I called my... Uh, contacted my favorite pastor 
uh, who taught me probably 85% of everything I know, and uh, wrote him and asked him if he'd like it, and he says, oh, absolutely, I would like to have that for my library. So I sent it to him. And, uh, but, uh, you know, that's the thing. When you study something, when you want to study something, one thing I learned in college, go to the source. Don't let other people tell you what other people believe. You know, if you want to know what Bob Walker believes, go find out from Bob Walker. Don't find out from, you know, Joe Blow down the street. No. When I studied what the Jehovah's Witnesses believed, I went and bought their material. I got one of their Bibles. You know, if I could pick up a Bible of theirs for 2 or $3 used at the bookstore, the used bookstore, you know, same thing I did with the Mormons, same thing I did with the Masonic Lodge, uh, the Catholics. That's exactly what I did. You know, I've, you know, oh, and, and when I first came to the Lord, um, I thought, hmm, why should I, you know, uh, if I, I want to learn about the Old Testament. And, I, and back then, I didn't know much better, but, you know, I thought, wow, you know, well, hey, the Jews are, you know, God's, if they're God's chosen people, the Old Testament's their book, I'm going to go to the rabbis and, and, you know, read what they had to say instead of listening to, you know, the Catholics or the Baptists or the Methodists or the Lutherans. So I went to the Jewish writings in, um, I went to Boca Raton, which is one of the largest Jewish communities in South Florida. South Florida is the third largest group of Jews in the United States from, you know, New York, Los Angeles, and then South Florida. And um, they actually had the, the Babylonian Talmud, which means learning, by the way. So the Babylonian Talmud is a collection of rabbis' opinions. It's their kind of their commentary on the law and different things. So Babylonian Talmud means Babylonian learning. It's what they call the oral traditions or the traditions of the elders. That's what Jesus condemned them for, was the traditions for the elders. But I started reading this on my own, and I was like in shock. So, yeah, I always go to the source. So, but the, uh, my, point, my point is this. Hiram the king figures prominently in the Masonic Lodge, part of the mist, their mysteries. You know, they have a lot of mysteries. They don't tell the mysteries. They're like, oh, well, we're going to lead you to the light and let you figure it out. But basically, in a nutshell, the Masonic Lodge is basically Judaism for Gentiles, basically. And one of their big things is the rebuilding of the temple. That's why they're free masons. Free as in not slaves. And masons, what do masons do? They, they stonework, you know, bricks and things of that nature. That's why they're freemasons. But Hiram and the temple figures very prominently in their work. Um, you know, like I say, I go to the source. Well, I don't really do it anymore. I spent a lot of years doing research, you know, instead of watching television, I did research, so, all right, but enough about me, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to brag and tell you how smart I am, because I'm not, I've done so many stupid things, uh, Lord doesn't have to spank me to keep me humble, because I've done so many stupid things. Matter of fact, I did something stupid recently. I went to Arkansas. Pray for me, people, about that, please. All right, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre, see, fits into the Masonic Lodge. They take a little bit out of the Bible, and then they add their little slant to it. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. All right, so verse 2, And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not 
could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. So David was not allowed to build the house. But what David did was is he assembled all the materials so that when Solomon came into power, everything was ready. All he had to do was get the workmen to put it, you know, fit it all together or a lot of it. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, but now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon. Remember um, the cedars of Lebanon? They were very famous. Hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. And it came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over this great people. Um, and Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. So, let's see. My servant shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea and floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and I will cause them to be discharged there, and thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accompany my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. All right, First Kings chapter 6. I'm going to skip around a little bit. I don't want to make this a, you know, this could be a two or three hour study if I really wanted to. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of, in the month Ziph, which is in the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Um, Passover was the beginning of the year, and it was usually like around last week of March to like the middle of April, somewhere in that range. So probably around May, um, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. All right, and then it gives you the uh, dimensions. All right, first Kings 6 and verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. Verse 21. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold. You want to know why those Roman soldiers wanted to tear the stones apart? The house was overlaid with gold. If, they, uh, if Herod followed the, um, the, the way that Solomon did it. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold, and he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle, and he overlaid it with gold. And the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that was by the oracle he overlaid with gold. Wow. All right, verse 38. 1 Kings 6, 38. And in the eleventh year, in the month 
bowl, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, and according to all the fashion of it, so was he seven years in building it. So Solomon's temple took seven years to build. Seven years. Uh, can you imagine with all the equipment they have now, um, how quickly they could build a temple? Seven years. Huh. Think about this. The time of Jacob's trouble and the time of sorrows is supposed to be seven years. Time of sorrows is three and a half, and then the time of Jacob's trouble, which some people call the Great Tribulation, 42 months, 1260 days, roughly three and a half years. But with the time of sorrows and the tribulation, it's about seven years. So the time of the building of the temple, seven years. I wonder if there's an application there. All right, 1 Kings 8, 19. Nevertheless, speaking to David, nevertheless thou shalt not, not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. See, David wasn't allowed to do it. All right, here's the preparations that David made for Solomon, his son. We're skipping around a little bit. Chronicles and the book of Kings are, uh, they tell the similar story, sometimes from a slightly different perspective, uh, sort of like the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke might record the same story, but a little bit different details. First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1, then David said, this is the house of the Lord, God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel, and he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. So they're cutting the stones. Verse 3, And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings, and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonians and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. So they did a lot of work for David and then continued under Solomon. Verse 5, And so, uh, David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceeding magnifical of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared a bundle abundantly before his death then he called for solomon his son and changed and charged him to build a house for the lord god of israel and david said to solomon my son as for me it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the lord my god but the word of the lord came to me saying thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars thou shalt not build a house unto my name because thou had Thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born unto thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, and his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build an house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I, shall, I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel, forever how long's forever forever now my son the lord be with thee and prosper thou and build the house of the lord thy god as he hath said of thee only the lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning israel that thou mayest keep the law of the lord thy god thou shalt then i'm sorry then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments with the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel, be strong, be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. You know, that's, that's how we should be. We should be strong, be of good courage, don't dread, don't be dismayed. You know, I look at the gathering storm clouds, 
coming upon Europe, England, the United States, and I look at the evil gathering upon us, it's hard sometimes to be strong and of good courage, not to dread, not to be dismayed. But ultimately, I know the Lord's in charge, and the Lord picked this time for us to be alive. I don't know why he picked me for this time. No idea. But he did. So, I guess, be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Verse 14. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold. I don't know what a talent was. Uh, let me look at it. Look it up. Uh, talent is about 35 kilograms or about 72 pounds. That's a lot of gold, people. Matter of fact, uh, in the book of Revelation, the Lord throws stones from heaven, if I remember correctly, in, in Revelation about the weight of a talent. Can you imagine getting uh, the headache you'd get from a 70-pound uh, stone falling from the uh, sky? Yeah. You'd need a whole bottle of bare aspirin for that, right? Yeah. I wanted to make sure. I, I thought it was around 70 pounds, but I wanted to make sure. So, he had, he said, uh, Now behold, in my trouble I prepared for the house of the Lord and hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight for it is in abundance timber also and stone have I prepared and thou mayest add thereto wow this was one magnificent building people alright so Solomon uh, built the temple All right, let's read 1 Kings chapter 8. This is, uh, I think this is the dedication of the temple when they, uh, you know, the grand opening, so to speak. Verse 1, 1 Kings 8, 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel on all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark, the ark of the covenant, of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for a multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto the place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. Uh, they had a place in the temple called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter into that one time a year. I think it was the Day of Atonement, if I remember correctly. Uh, let's see. Verse 7. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark, and the staves thereof. A um, little note here. These two cherubims with the wings facing each other over the mercy seat. I think one of them was symbol, a symbol, symbolizing uh, Satan before he fell. I think he was one of the he was the cherub that covered covered the throne of God. I've covered that in other Bible studies, so we won't go there. I'm just throwing that out there. Verse eight. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and they, and there they are unto this day. Uh, a stave is like a pole, and they ran the poles 
into the uh, the rings that were holding uh, the ark. Verse 9. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. These two tables of stone were the Ten Commandments people. That's that Moses brought down. That's what these two tables of stone were. The two tables of stone which Moses put there in Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Now, um, there's people that will tell you that this is the Shekinah. S-H-E, she, K-I-N-A-H. Which they'll tell you, oh, that's the Shekinah. The glory of the Lord. Uh, no. The Shekinah comes from Kabbalah, which is witchcraft masquerading as Judaism. And the Shekinah is the wife of God. They call her the Holy Spirit. So God the Father and his wife, the Holy Spirit, got together and she got pregnant and then she had a son, the Son of God. Uh, yeah, but the Bible always calls the Holy Spirit as a he. Sometimes, there's a couple, once or twice or a couple times that uh, the Holy Spirit's referred to as an it. But even Jesus was referred to as an it in, I think, in the book of Luke, when uh, Gabriel said, um, it shall something, you know, it shall something or other, uh, the holy, it shall be the holy thing or something like that. No, I was wrong. Luke one thirty five, And the angel answered and said unto her, Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, thing, which shall be born of thee shall, uh, shall be called the Son of God. So a thing, not an it. But usually the Holy Spirit is called he. So when they tell you the she, kinda, uh, the wife of God, the Holy Spirit, wrong. You're listening to Kabbalah. All right. Um, back to 1 Kings 8, verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand a minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I choose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build an house, that my name might be therein. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was, all right, and it was in the heart of David my father to build an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build an house unto my name, Thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel." And I have set there a place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants, 
that walk before thee with all their heart, who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised, promised him, thou speakest also with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled in thine heart, as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in thy sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou speakest unto thy servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth. Behold, the heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. Yet thou hast, uh, yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayest before thee today, that thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive forgive. If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and do, and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy. Listen carefully, people. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned, because they have sinned against thee. Uh, can we make an application of this for today? Oh, yeah. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn, against, uh, and shall turn again to thee and confess, confess thy name and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. You know, that's what they want. That's what the Lord wants you to do. When you're smitten before your enemies because you've sinned, turn back to the Lord, confess his name, pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people Israel. Then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee. Oh, but Al Gore told me it was global warming. Too many people on the earth. Uh, I don't think so. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk. And give rain unto thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. If there be in the land famine, it's coming, people. If there be pestilence, they say it's here with the virus, right? Blasting, mildew, locusts. Do you know there are swarms of locusts in the Middle East right now? Or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, 
and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou even thou knowest knowest the hearts of all the children of men that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers moreover concerning a stranger that is not of thy people israel but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake for they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm when he shall come and pray toward this house hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for for all the people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people Israel, that they may know that this house which I builded is called by thy name. If thy people go to battle against their enemy, whithersoever they, thou shalt send them, and shall pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house that I have built for thy name, then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near, yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whether they were carried captives, and repent, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned. You know what, people? Those are the three words that the Lord loves to hear the most from our mouths. We have sinned and have done perversely and have committed wickedness and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built, for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. You know what, people? The first time I looked at iron in the Bible, the first time is mentioned from the line, the lineage, the the children of Cain. And then the Canaanites were of the of of Ham. You had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now I'm not talking about pork, or pig, bacon, no. Uh, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Shem was the uh, chosen seed. Japheth was to dwell among uh, Shem, but Ham had um, Canaan, and Canaan was cursed. Canaan became the Canaanites. And here it is, uh, the Ethiopians and Egypt were of Canaan. That doesn't, some people say, oh, well, that's, you know, Ethiopia, that's proof that uh, they were black. No, no, it's not. It doesn't mean they were black at all. Uh, Haiti, uh, which was part of the island of Hispaniola, was originally uh, native Indians. Uh, and then they were displaced by the Spaniards, and then the French, and the French, and then they imported the, the black slaves. Well, then the black slaves killed all the whites on the island. But you go to Haiti now, and there's, you know, it's like 99% black. But it wasn't always that way. Well, I think Ethiopia was the same way. Uh, but Ethiopia and Egypt were uh, part of the... Egypt 
was called the land of Ham. So, keep that in mind. For uh, Verse 51, For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of fire, that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant, when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven, and he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And let these my words wherewith I have made supplications before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times, as the matter shall require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is none else. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord, two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the Lord and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So I was right. This is the dedication of the house of the Lord. I thought so. It's been a while since I've read this stuff. You know, a lot of times I'm doing this stuff from memory. So, you know... If I make a couple mistakes, hey, give me a break, please. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. I know one day I'm going to have to give an account for every word I've ever spoken in the, you know, for Bible studies. So, so the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. And at that time Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with him, a great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days seven days and seven days, even fourteen days. On the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went under their tents, joyful and glad of heart, for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant, and for Israel his people. Whew, I'm out of breath. Uh, you know, I just noticed, First Kings chapter 8. 8 usually means a new beginning. Uh, the um, when a male child was born, he was to be circumcised on the eighth day. How many chapters is this in First Kings chapter eight? Sixty-six. How many books in the Bible? Sixty-six. How many chapters in Isaiah? Sixty-six. What's the number of man? Six, six, six. Satan imitates everything that God creates. Keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to cut this off right here because I've already gone out over an hour and it's almost, it's getting close to four o'clock in the morning and I'm tired, people. I got to get some sleep. Um, it's the only time I've got quiet time in the house to do these Bible studies. So, you know, uh, and I'm not even, I'm only probably, maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm halfway done. So this was Solomon's temple. Boy, he had a lot of gold and a lot of silver. And he overlaid the whole temple with gold. So, 
And gold, if you take out the L, well, if you take God and put an L in it, G-O-L-D, you got gold. Remove the L and you got God. Uh, God was likened unto gold in the Bible. Man, in his perf uh, spiritual state, was likened unto silver. Um, it appears the Canaanites were likened unto iron, but then man in his, uh, the covenant man in his unregenerated state, I believe was bronze. You know, it's interesting. Numbers have meanings in the Bible. Colors have meanings in the Bible. Metals have meanings in the Bible. Uh, you know, Satan was called the great red dragon. Uh, blue was, uh, if I remember correctly, was to, uh, they were supposed to put a hem on their garments of blue, and that was to get remind them of God's law. Why was the sky blue? Well, before they started spraying the skies with Lord knows what, um, I remember a blue sky and a yellow sun. But, yeah, that was before, that was back in the 70s and the 80s. They started spraying everything I first noticed in the 90s. So, what can I tell you? All right, well, this is going to be part one. All blessings, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.